Hello uh, and welcome. My name is Scott Farber and uh, this presentation is going to be about the college essay, how to make an application stand out. I think before we jump right into stuff, uh, I want to take a little bit of time to give you my background, why it is that I think that I've got a couple of things to share with you. And um, uh, based on some of my experiences can hopefully guide you through your processes as you guys get ready to write the college essay or parents as you tune in and tune in and try and figure out how best to help your students get ready without going totally nuts in the process. Um, by way of a background, I'm going to tell you my life story in these opening couple of minutes. I was born in the Bronx and I grew up in and around New York City. And when I was in high school in 10th grade, my dad bought a minor league basketball team and I moved to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. That was literally the coolest thing that could happen to a high school boy. I was the owner's son in a new town, so I could hang out with the players, I could hang out with the cheerleaders, go down to the court, give away tickets, give away t-shirts. It was an amazing experience. Unfortunately, after six months, the team went bankrupt. Not so cool anymore. If you think about it, a move in the middle of high school can be exceptionally traumatic. You've got to pick up and rebuild your life in a new place. You've got to make all new friends. You have to go to an all new school. At the time, I didn't realize how character building that was going to be. For me, it was just incredibly frustrating to have moved away from New York to go to central Pennsylvania and have all of these dreams fall down all around me. When I work with my students, <coughs> I often tell them, that when I was in high school, I kind of majored in field trips. If I could find a reason to get out of class, I definitely took it. To be fair, I didn't just skip class, but what I did is I pursued my interests. I wasn't just about learning in the classroom. Any opportunity I could find to extend it beyond the classroom, I seized that moment. So I was editor-in-chief of the newspaper, and I would go on journalism conferences. I was president of student government, and I would get involved in all sorts of youth and government projects. I worked for the House of Representatives when I was in high school. I actually got to give a speech on the Capitol steps in Pennsylvania. I got elected to the school board when I was in high school. I had all of those extra curricular activities that we often tell students are incredibly important uh, to pursue when you're in high school. At the time, I didn't pursue them for a college resume. I didn't pursue them to write a better college essay. But my experiences in high school did ultimately come together to create a much stronger applicant when I started sending off all of my applications to schools. When I take a look back at my high school career and I start thinking about how all those pieces fit together, I can't tell you that I understood all of it at that time. I can only tell you that with hindsight, which is 2020, it was really lucky that I pursued all of these things in the times that I did, because when it came time to apply and I was looking at colleges, my mother encouraged me to apply to a lot of different schools, not knowing where I was going to get in. This is a really important concept. When we start thinking about the college process and how the college essay fits in, you want to realize that being able to put yourself out there to a number of different places is the best way to assure that you're going to have some good options when it comes time to take a look at your acceptances and where you're going to take your next steps when you leave high school. Now, I needed to find a place that was going to have an amazing amount of financial aid for me because as my family was in dire economic straits, the basketball team had gone bankrupt, I didn't really know where it was that I was going to go to school, but financial aid was going to play a big role. And in order to convince somebody that you're worthy of that financial aid package at the most elite schools, it's not just about an SAT score or an ACT score, and it's not just about a GPA. The college essay is really what can help you come off the page, can actually take all of your high school experiences and translate into a vivid image of who you are as an applicant. Again, I didn't know it then, but in hindsight, it proved to be incredibly valuable. Now, I applied to Georgetown because they had a great foreign service school and I wanted to study international relations. I was very lucky. I was accepted to Georgetown and they gave me a big, big financial aid package. I also applied to Duke because they also have a really strong international relations program. And I was lucky I got in there and they gave me even more money. And then I took the giant leap of faith and my mother said, whoever thinks you would have a chance, but why not throw the application in there anyway? And I applied to Harvard University and I was accepted and they basically gave me a full ride. When I take a look back at the college process from where I started to where I finished, I had no real guidance other than to say that I need to try and translate every experience I've had outside of school into some way that I can present it to a college and the college essay and the essays that are going to be required beyond the personal statement, an amazing opportunity for you as students to tell your story in your own words to colleges that are looking for kids that are different from everyone else.
Now, getting into Harvard University was very, very exciting for me. Getting a bunch of financial aid was even better. I only paid about $1,000 or $2,000 a year to go to school and was through work study. I cleaned toilets when I was in college. Got to tell you, cleaning toilets, not the best job in the world. But going to school where I went opened doors for me for the rest of my life. I got a degree in international relations, and when I graduated, I was hoping that I was going to become an ambassador. Turns out that at 22 years old, no one will let you be an ambassador. I was kind of disappointed. My friends were interviewing at McKinsey, they were interviewing at Goldman, they were headed off to very successful lives. I just couldn't picture myself going exactly in that direction. And so I picked up and I moved to South America. My mother, not impressed with my plan at all. Parents out there, I completely understand when your kids graduate from school, you want them to get real jobs. At the same time as my parents asked me what I wanted to do, I didn't have a clear picture yet. And so I moved to South America, went to work for the British government, running a small environmental project on the coast of Ecuador. It was an amazing experience. And for the first time in my life, I started to understand that education and supporting kids in their educational opportunities and then supporting communities as they invest in education was a phenomenal opportunity for me. Because when you think about it, I spent most of my school career thinking that education was about what you could learn inside of the four walls of a classroom. I spent most of my time thinking about what I was going to memorize for a test on a Friday. In the big picture, however, that's not really what education is. What's education really about? It's about equipping somebody with a set of tools to go off into the world and solve problems. That's what I was doing in Ecuador. I wound up creating a functioning trash system. I wound up creating an organic recycling uh, plant. We wound up building a school. And at the end of six months, I looked at what we had created. My best friend and I were really, really proud that we had built something important. But if I trace it back to where I was when I started in high school and I started thinking about what I was trying to put together to get to college, all of them were a series of steps to be able to open more doors. Think of the college essay is that last turn of the key to open up a college experience, which is going to ultimately open up what happens when you leave with your degree. At the end of six months, my best friend and I, we looked at each other. We had brought the project in ahead of schedule and under budget. The ambassador offered us an opportunity to go out and do some more development projects for the British government. And we turned to each other and we said, well, running water twice a day, no hot water ever, rolling blackouts. It's been sweet, but we'd like to do a little exploring on our own. And he and I, we picked up our machetes and we marched off into Bolivia, Peru, Argentina, Chile, and Brazil. For 13 months, we wandered through the Amazon, we wandered through the Andes, and everywhere we went, what we discovered is those places that invested in education were outperforming everywhere else. Santiago, Chile is an amazingly cosmopolitan city. Rural Bolivia could use some more development work. The more I started thinking about education in that sense and helping connect the dots from A to B, the more I realized that because I was so lucky in high school, that would be an opportunity for me to be able to do something important for other kids. Other high school students that didn't understand how to navigate the process from high school to college because all of a sudden a whole new world opened up to me. I tell you this story because I want you to realize that your path is far from complete. In fact, it's just beginning. But as you start to think about the stories that are going to make you up in terms of what you're presenting to the college, in no way does everyone expect that all of these other chapters would have been written yet. You're just beginning. When I came back to New York um, after the year, the 13 months that I spent overseas, I looked around at the high school education system and I got a job working for a company that specialized in the SAT. To be honest, the SAT, you guys that are sitting here and thinking to yourselves, wow, I really hated that experience. Test preparation was awful. Scores I got, I'm so glad I'm over with it. Those of you who are seniors that are retaking it, you're so mad that you still have to focus on this test. I get it. But the SAT that represents, or the ACT represents one portion of the application process. And it's important at the outset that you realize where it fits in, in relation to the college essay. Colleges kind of use the SAT and the ACT and your GPA as roughly equal components in your college application. Some schools will tell you that it represents 50% of the total. Some school will tell you that it represents 80% of the total. But more and more schools will tell you that the college essay will be the next, mo the uh, personal statement part of the college essay and the supplemental essays will represent the next most important part of your application. Again, because it's your story in your own words. So while I was working at this company, I realized that just doing SAT stuff was not enough. I went to my boss and I said, listen, I think we could do more here. And I'd like to be able to provide this advice, not simply to help students get a score, but to help them get into college. And I think we should do more work around the college essay. He said, you know, that sounds lovely, Scott, but I don't think we're going to do that. 
The more time I spent at the company, the more I realized that my goals diverged from my bosses. I wanted to work with schools and I wanted to work with educational nonprofits. I wanted to be able to expand the vision of the high school process to help students succeed after they left high school. After my second year, all of the things I wanted to do, my boss said we weren't going to do them. And so I left to start my own company in 2005. It's called A-List Education. Since 2005, when we started with five students, just last year we served 30,000 students spread across the United States. Since we've started, we've helped more than 75,000 kids move from high school into college. We have an office in London, we opened in Dubai, we have operations in China, in Switzerland. All of this was born out of my car and my apartment with a group of dedicated partners. So it all starts from very, very small things. Now I've told you all of this because I need you to understand that there are going to be a lot of people that offer you advice about the college essay. There are going to be a lot of people that are going to try and help you in this process. Not all of them have a full appreciation for what goes into this beyond simply their narrow perspective. I kind of sit in a unique position. I've personally worked with about 4,000 kids. I've helped students craft probably about 10,000 essays. I've spent more than 12,000 hours working with high school students on the SAT, the ACT, the college essay. That means that I'm a super nerd because I work on all the things that nobody else wants to work on. But it also means that I've got a range of experiences that I think that I can share with you that are gonna help you as you navigate what can be sometimes a confusing and overwhelming process. So now that I've given you a bit of an introduction and a bit of an insight into who I am and what I do, I think it's important that we kind of pivot to talk about the college essay and where you sit inside of the college essay, where you are currently at in the process. Now, you guys are allowed to send me questions um, as we go. And it's important that you understand that as you actually have questions, I may or may not be able to answer all of them right away. Um, I might have to take a little bit of time to talk about some other things, but I would like you to be able to send me questions as you have them because the more questions I get the more I can tailor this to the help that you need. Okay let's talk about how the process should work. Most students that start off thinking about the college essay I think approach this in a somewhat backwards way. You often think that the idea that you should come up with should be super unique from the beginning. For instance, my life is a big red shoe or some equally crazy metaphor that you think makes your essay sound different. That's the backwards way to do this entire process. You don't wanna try and pick your theme first. What you wanna do is begin going in a lot of different directions. The goal here is to, at the very beginning, set out a whole bunch of different opportunities to hit on the different pieces of your life that make you you. Think about what I said before about what I was like in high school. I was involved in the newspaper, I was involved in student government, I did programs related to the school board. All of those different pieces in some way I wanted to be represented in my personal statement. So you can't pick your theme first. In fact, what you should really be working on is trying to get a whole bunch of different stories that make up you written down. I call that first process the interview. When I say the interview, <clears throat> we have a brainstorming document that I'm happy to share with you. Um, you can certainly email me at the end of this. But in the brainstorming document that we have, I ask a whole bunch of questions as if we were interviewing you for, um, uh, let's just call it any old newscast. We want to understand where you come from. And the college admissions office needs to understand what separates you from everyone else. So some of this might be about extracurricular activities. Some of this might be about jobs you've had. Some of this could be your international background. Some of these can be about adversity that you've overcome. But in that interview part, what we're trying to do is get started. You're not going to write the perfect essay to begin with, and you shouldn't try. In fact, you shouldn't set out to write the personal statement. You should really set out an opportunity to write a whole bunch of stories about you, and we'll see how they connect. As we get past the interview process, we would move into brainstorming. When we talk about brainstorming, what we're really saying is that now that you've got a bit of an idea of the different things that you want to highlight, um, let's start to figure out which of these are going to be the most important, ah, look at my crazy drawing there, the most important to turn into essays. We then go to drafting and revising. Notice, by the way, that this doesn't show up until the third step. The reason shows up as the third step is because quite simply what you want to do is you want to wait to begin writing your essay until you've actually got a bunch of different ideas to pursue. Then you'll go with the final draft. So the process really is start by getting all of your ideas out, 
begin to build on those ideas by brainstorming further topics so that you can be more thorough in exploring those ideas. Then begin to draft the essay and get some help revising, and then you'll get to the final draft. So getting started, topic selection. When I'm talking about the topic selection, what I mean is using the interview and brainstorming in multiple directions. Let's talk about that for a second. What we're talking about when we say um, brainstorming in multiple directions and using the interview, I'm going to give you an example. I had a young lady that I was working with, this was maybe about five years ago or so, and she really wanted to write about her sister. She wanted to write about her sister because her sister's life was a really, had a really big impact on her life. Her sister had suffered from a very scary illness, and at one point in time, nobody was certain that her sister was going to make it. If you can imagine being a young woman at 10, 11, 12, or a young girl at 10, 11, 12, and thinking you might lose your sister, you can imagine how painful and scary that would be. I told her she couldn't write that essay. She was livid. First of all, you can't write an essay about somebody else. The colleges need to know who you are. So as a starting point, if the essay is always outwardly focused on somebody that's not you, you're going in a bad direction. But really, I thought that she had missed the opportunity to tell a lot of stories of who she was. So we used the interview to start discussing other aspects of her personal story. And it turned out that she had actually decided to volunteer at a local hospital to read to siblings who were visiting the hospital because their siblings were undergoing some sort of treatment at the hospital for some sort of illness. When you think about it, there was a direct thread to connect back to her sister. She also had decided that she had wanted to become a doctor. And in deciding that, she had an internship at a nearby hospital, yet another connection to something relating to hospitals, treating illnesses, and perhaps being able to heal somebody. Finally, when we took a look at all of these different pieces, we realized that these stories really tied together with one other young lady who is actually sitting in the experience as an 11-year-old dealing with the potential loss of her sister. So what we did is we tied all of these threads together because when you go in multiple directions, what you're really thinking to yourself is that there will be overlapping themes. When we take a look at those overlapping themes, now we can tell a compelling story and tie the threads together. What we did is we situated my student in the room in the hospital where she was reading to other children and she was reading Green Eggs and Ham. So the essay itself had interspersed throughout excerpts from Green Eggs and Ham. But what she was able to tell in between those excerpts was a story about what brought her to the hospital to begin with, what kept her thinking about a medical field as something she wanted to pursue for her intellectual interests, and how the community service aspect helped bridge the gap between a young lady who was sitting in the situation she was sitting and where she now as an older girl could actually be able to help. That's why we try and go in multiple directions, because the threads, the things that bind your story together, only become evident after you've written a bunch of things out. I had another student who was trying to write about how his genetic research in a lab over the summer was what he wanted to pursue when he applied to college. On the one hand, that sounds amazing. Let's talk about your genetic research and your internship. But that's a very one-dimensional story. What I wanted to be able to do is help him see that he was more than a science student. So in brainstorming other activities he was involved in and things he enjoyed, he explained that he really liked baking pies. Baking pies, huh? Well, baking pies is not what I generally associate with a kid who might be spending time in a science lab. But what we did when we discovered that his hobby was baking pies, or rather when I discovered it and helped draw this out of him, is we tied together the exact steps that he needed to do to bake pies with the steps that he needed to do in order to create the lab environment and the tests he needed to run on the genetic material. We talked about how he pursues a process and sometimes he fails, but he learns from it. And it doesn't matter if it's a pecan pie or it doesn't matter if it's something in a petri dish. Even in the failures, there's a lesson to be drawn. Notice, by the way, that you wouldn't necessarily associate baking pies and a summer internship at a genetics laboratory, but understand the underlying lessons actually really do reinforce one another. That's what I mean about brainstorming in multiple directions. Now, when we talk about how valuable this is for the application, what you're really trying to do is you're trying to make sure that you tell a broad enough or paint a broad enough picture of who you are that you can jump off the page. Now, the essay gives you a valuable opportunity to do that, but I don't want to confuse the issue and say that if you've got a 400 on the SAT reading section, that your amazing essay is going to get you into Yale. It's not going to happen that way. And that's okay. 
Not everybody needs to go to Yale. It's totally fine. There's going to be a great school for you. But don't think that just because you write a great essay, you can overcome other stats that would keep the college from being able to let you in. I point out that the college essay is one thing that you can use to distinguish yourself, but only after you've cleared the other hurdles to really have your application seriously evaluated by the college. SAT scores, ACT scores, GPAs, SAT subject tests, they're going to count you into consideration. They are not going to get you into college. And that's an important note because you are more than that number on a piece of paper. I love to share with students that the year I applied to school, two thirds of the kids with perfect SAT scores were rejected from Harvard and I got in and I did not have perfect scores. So the essay can be very useful to distinguish you once you've cleared the hurdle. But this quote that I have here is actually from Dean Fitzsimmons at Harvard, a good essay can heal the sick, but it can't raise the dead. I think that's good advice. If you have some things that put you on the borderline, your GPA is close to what they want, but you know what, you had a bad semester, or your SAT scores weren't great, but you know what, you do terribly in standardized testing because it's the most anxiety-ridden experience of your entire life, you wanna pull your hair out, you can't believe you made it out alive, and yeah, you're 30 to 40 points below the middle 50% of the people that are getting into Duke this year. That's where the essay can play an exceptionally large role. It's also useful for what we call presenting the right image. The student that I mentioned just before who had created the essay about pies, I needed to be able to help him understand that we had to have a multi-dimensional applicant. You don't want to arrive just saying, I'm this one guy or this one girl. You want to be able to present a broader picture of who you are. That means that when you've got an opportunity to tell that story, presenting the right image isn't necessarily one dimensional, but a multi-dimensional picture of who you are, because I'm going to assume that you're more than just one thing. Now, when we talk about getting started and we talk about presenting the right image, it's useful to understand that there are some things that you might want to avoid. What do I mean? Well, there are certain students that have in their heads that in telling a very painful story from their childhood, that this will help garner a certain sympathy from a college admissions officer. On the one hand, sharing your background could be very useful. But if you don't explain how that background impacts who you are today, and show some tangible evidence that you have learned from that experience, you're not really doing what you need to do here. You don't want to write an essay that's just a woe is me essay, a long list of everything that's gone wrong in your life. That is not going to demonstrate a real mature view of how learning from adversity can make you a stronger person. Now that one might seem obvious, but there are other ones that are not so obvious. Sometimes when students talk about overcoming a challenge, they don't realize that the challenge that they're talking about can give the wrong image to a college admissions officer. Simple ones, if you've had challenges in high school with academics, but you haven't really succeeded yet, and you're looking to college to be able to get a clean start, that is not the essay to write. You don't want to tell a college, listen, I have totally messed up in high school, but I can't wait to come to your college and start all over again. That's not going to make a lot of sense. Also, what do you want to avoid? You want to avoid things like talking about drugs or alcohol or how you're no longer part of the cool crew, how you just broke up from your boy with your boyfriend or your girlfriend. You want to avoid talking about um, overcoming issues with violence. I had one student who wrote an essay and he wants to talk about his anger management class and how he's now graduated from his anger management class and he doesn't feel like he's a threat to the community. Man, if you get an essay and you're a college admissions officer and some kid is telling you about how he's just finished anger management class and he doesn't think he's a threat to the community, that's going right into the reject pile. So be careful. You don't want to overshare here, but you do want to be able to still present an honest picture. Some other things that you might want to avoid, although there are right and wrong ways to do this, you might want to avoid getting into a political argument. Simply attacking some part of the country as being politically ignorant or socially reprehensible is probably not the best way to identify yourselves as somebody that would, as people that would be open to new ideas. You want to watch out that you don't have too strong an opinion that criticizes somebody else in the essay. Something else that might be something you want to avoid is writing about the life of a grandparent or a parent. I know that grandparents and parents have played tremendous roles in many of your lives. 
by the same token, the essay is supposed to be about you. And if the whole essay is just about what grandpa taught you or what grandma has taught you, you may not be able to tell the complete picture of who you are because I don't see you using that out in the world. Generally, schools will say things like avoid writing about a loved one unless for some reason it is just the greatest topic that you could have ever come up with because it fits into 20 other things in your life, in which case, fine. But in general, you want to avoid things like that. You also want to avoid writing too little. Some students think they can make their point in just a few hundred words. I would suggest that while you don't need to necessarily use all 650 words to tell your story, if you think you've got everything out there that's important about you in 271 words, I would hazard a guess this looks a little bit weak and light in terms of the last 17 years of your life. So it would be useful to be able to provide more information than erring on the side of providing too little. It's also important that as you begin, that you identify all of your essay requirements. Now, when I say all of your essay requirements, many people have the mistaken identity, or the mistaken idea rather, that what you have is one personal statement. That's just not how it is. The personal statement is one part of the application process. It is a big part of the application process, but it is only one of the essays. Many of your colleges will require you to write additional essays. When I talk about writing additional essays, these are the supplemental essays. And these supplemental essays can be very, very important in being able to present a balanced picture of who you are as a student. When we think about that, what we're saying is your brainstorm that goes in many different directions can in fact begin to create the basis for your other essays too. The reason we start by brainstorming in a number of different directions is because you're not just writing one essay. Many students that are applying to elite colleges are going to be facing 17, 20, 30, 35 requirements, which is a lot of essay work. Now, I am going to share with you a tool that I find to be incredibly useful that will help you actually navigate the process more efficiently. At the very least, you want to make sure that you can identify all all of your essay requirements at the beginning so anything that doesn't make it into the personal statement can at the very least wind up finding its way into a supplemental essay. So college essay organizer. College essay organizer is a really really valuable tool. Uh, it's something that we developed in partnership with a company uh, here in New York and basically it was the fruits of a lot of different conversation with parents and students in schools. When you're applying to a lot of schools and you understand that you're going to have a lot of essay questions, getting started and knowing what those essay questions are is essential. College Essay Organizer, if you sign in, you can actually select up to 25 colleges and at the touch of a button, it will give you all of the essay requirements that you face. This is very important to do now. Why? Well, as you start to think about what goes into the personal statement, if you know you have a whole bunch of other essays to write, you might choose to include two or three items in your personal statement and four of the other brainstorms you might actually be leaving to put somewhere else. So you might be using those in the supplemental essays, but you'll only know you have them if you bother to search for them. So you do want to go get all of your essay questions. Um, in the interest of full disclosure, there is also something that you can buy on College Essay Organizer that we call the road map and that allows you to take a look at your 35 required questions and because we wrote an algorithm to make all of this simple which we tagged all of the essay questions with we can show you how to write the fewest number of essays to satisfy all of your requirements it might very well be that you have 27 requirements but you actually have to write only four essays if you knew at the beginning the colleges that you were applying to, you might be able to write, say, a, or an essay that addresses adversity, and that'll work for college A, question one, college B, question two, college C, question five. So you can use the essay to fit a number of different categories. That's a great way to be very, very efficient. Your application needs to stand out, not just for your personal statement, but for the supplements as well. Think about it for a second. You're an elite school. You're a University of Chicago. You are a Stanford. You are a Princeton. You're going to want to know that your students did more than write one essay. In fact, you're going to have some specific things you want to ask a student that's going to see or help you see whether or not that student is going to be a good fit for campus. As an example, the University of Chicago values creativity. Some of their supplements are, honestly, the most unique questions in all of the application process. I remember one from two years ago, it was something like, can you write a short story involving the backseat of a bus, a one-way ticket, and a piece of toast? 
Okay, that one is going to take some thought. But you do realize the University of Chicago is looking for you to take some thought. So the supple, supplemental essays matter. When we talk about the college essay and making your application stand out, I can't emphasize enough that it's not just about the personal statement, but those supplemental interests, the supplemental essays definitely matter. As a starting point, though, let's highlight the fact that the Common App is where most of you will begin with a personal statement. And if you're not using the Common App, um, then you might want to think to yourself um, that you should probably check it out. It launched at uh, commonapp.org on August 1st. This is a starting point for most of our students because that's the first biggest entry point to most colleges. Now, I'm going to pause for one second um, because I've got a couple of questions that have come in and one of them piqued my interest. Um, is it best to avoid a disease related story you overcame? Now I talked before about trying to avoid things that came across as a little bit too, um, I don't want to call it a sob story because that's not fair and that sounds like I'm being flippant and I don't want to disregard the fact that many of us have faced some real challenging personal times to get to where we are. The disease story can actually be a very valuable one if the story that you're able to tell can highlight something that is so central to your identity that your application would be incomplete without it. We were talking about the Common App and this is the first of the bullet points that they offer, the first of the prompts that you can write about. I've had some students that have overcome scoliosis, that have overcome cancer, that have fought back diseases that they thought would make them lose limbs, that would lose their sight, and one that recovered from brain cancer. There can be very, very powerful, life-affirming stories that come from overcoming disease, without a doubt. Be careful that you have to actually draw the lesson so that we want to make sure that we say central to your identity. It's not just something you experienced, but something that you learn from. If that's the case, that story can be incredibly valuable. Now, for those of you who are sitting somewhere saying, I wish I had a story like that to tell. Two things. First of all, you don't wish you had a story like that to tell because nobody wants to face disease. So let's be honest about that. But number two, just because you don't have a, a challenging life moment like that doesn't mean that you don't have challenging moments. Those on a degree scale would certainly seem relatively more life or death than something smaller. But colleges understand that you come from a range of different backgrounds. There's no one story that could stand out. Many of the students that we work with come from pretty comfortable lives and they haven't had anything go wrong. Okay, well things that can go wrong in a lot of different ways beyond it being something that's life-threatening. For instance, I had a student who uh, had said, I have a very charmed life. I live in a very comfortable suburb. My parents get me everything I want. First of all, good for you. I'm very thrilled that you come from such a great background. Some of us do not. By the same token, when he told me all of this, I said, there must have been a moment where something in your life didn't go right. It's like, well, of course. He had completely missed that adversity is simply a challenging moment. Adversity doesn't have to mean that you're coming from very impoverished circumstances or that your life has been one tragedy after another. Adversity can be any moment where life just didn't go the way that you planned. So in fact, what we did is we told a story about a penalty shootout that occurred at the end of the state championship game for his soccer team. He lined up to take the penalty. It all came down to him. And rather than putting it in the back of the net, he put it about 20 feet over the crossbar. His team lost the game. They lost the state finals, and he was devastated. That is a moment of adversity. In fact, he thought about quitting the soccer team for good. He wound up staying on. He wound up joining the following year. He wound up making the team again. His teammates wound up forgiving him. The story there of overcoming adversity may not have been the same as a student that might have been afflicted with a terrible disease, but at the same time, what a college is looking for is can you face a challenge, learn from it, and commit yourself to growing? That's what they're looking for. You've probably heard the phrase getting outside of your comfort zone. That's something that many colleges will talk about. And that's something that I think is a great opportunity for you to look at adversity in a broader picture. Another question just came in, by the way, um, and I think that it's useful here too, um, about using quotes to get started uh, in an essay or using quotes somewhere in your essay. Sometimes when students are telling stories to stick with this adversity thing for a moment, they invent dialogue. If you're going to use quotes, and I'm going to talk about two different quotes, ones that are supposed to be directly attributed to somebody, those can be exceptionally powerful in introductions to the essay. If you're sitting across from a doctor and the doctor gives you um, a prognosis and says, you're going to go through three months of chemotherapy and it's not going to be easy. 
that quote coming from a doctor and then your response to it can be an amazing use of quotes. If your doctor is not giving the quote and instead you're making up dialogue for how you just won the state championship in the football game and everyone is like, yeah, we're the best, that's kind of weak. That's not going to actually wind up pumping the story up in a meaningful way. You can sum that up with some narrative description. Now, the other quotes that you might be referring to is quoting somebody else. Quoting somebody else can be useful, but only in the context as it advances your ideas. Colleges, they know lots of quotes. Many of you choose quotes that, honestly, we all know. And because they're just thrown in as a kind of a, a nod towards what we think that colleges want to hear, then those don't really have tremendous value. By contrast, I can tell you a quote that means a lot to me. I personally went through some very, very difficult situations recently this year. Um, we're not going to get into them right now because it's not really necessary, but I'm tell you that I had some real challenges that I was facing. And in facing those challenges, I had come across a quote from Dr. Martin Luther King that resonated with me. And it's from a sermon that he wrote called Ingratitude. And the quote is, ingratitude is the greatest of all sins because the sinner fails to recognize his dependence on others. And I had found myself casting about looking for some kind of way to look at the world differently. When I read that quote, all of a sudden, the clouds parted, the sun was shining again, and I realized that for all of the frustration and pain I was feeling, I needed to be grateful for what I had. That quote, I came across at a very dark moment in my life, and I needed that quote. If you have something like that, absolutely put it in. That can be incredibly valuable. Quotes that are meaningful, they better be personal. They better have some connection to an activity or when you found it or something along those lines. And then without a doubt, use a quote. Now, when we talk about the Common App and we talk about um, these different stories that you've got, I noticed, by the way, the, or not notice, I want to highlight here, we talk about stuff that's central to your identity. And I lump that together in the experienced failure part. Um, when we talk about things that are central to your identity, they don't have to just be negative things. It could be a great achievement. So it might be that your central uh, moment of identity is an amazing win you had as a gymnast. It might be the time that you climbed Mount Everest. Um, I doubt that you have, but maybe you have, and that would be great for you. If you have something like that, certain, certainly use that as a central defining moment for your identity. But beware. When you think about some of these, you often neglect to think about what a reader sees when the reader takes a look at that same experience. As an example, I had a student that a couple years ago was writing about a trip to Africa. And in writing about her trip to Africa, she was trying to highlight that she was very moved by some of the struggles in the villages that she visited. And that led her to look at the world differently. On its surface, that seems like a fine theme. But actually what she wound up doing was writing about how her family had had an amazing trip to South Africa. They had flown first class. They had stayed at the Four Seasons before they went on safari. Man, if central to your identity is that you could go on a five-star vacation while looking around at the impoverished world developing world in Africa, that's not the identity that you want to be able to share. So be careful in the way that you present what's central to your identity. Have somebody else read it. Make sure that the identity you think you're presenting is actually the one that the reader might see. Now, let's take a look at some of the other ones so I can give you some ideas of how you might get started. Reflect on a time when you challenged a belief or idea. What prompted you to act? This prompt and this question often leads students to take a somewhat self-righteous approach, as in, I saw a bully. And when I saw that bully, my blood boiled and I swooped in and I saved this child. And because I saved this child, I probably set him off on a much better future. Look at me and how great it was that I challenged a bully. Two things. Number one, it sounds fake. You may have challenged a bully, but the way that that picture is presented is one that many, many, many students will put out there. So if you're challenging a belief or an idea, don't just have an artificial straw man bad guy. Try and engage more deeply. Obviously, we want people to challenge bullies. Are you the only one that's ever stood up to a bully? No. Many people have. 
So if you're looking for something original, try and find a moment where perhaps your ideas were challenged and you learned something. Rather than trying to assert yourself as the hero of the story, have yourself be somewhat vulnerable. Colleges don't think that at 16 years old or 17 years old or 18 years old that you have somehow solved every single problem in the world. Nor do they expect that you are somehow the caped crusader. Now, by the way, if you are, in fact, Clark Kent in real life, awesome for you, great. But let's assume for a second that you're not. It would be a more powerful story to talk about not just when you challenge a belief or idea to somebody else, but when you met somebody else, your ideas and beliefs were challenged. And so you had to challenge your preconceived notions in your own mind, and you emerged a stronger person for it. That would be a great example. Describe a place or an environment where you are perfectly content. Many students overlook, it, overlook this and think to themselves, well, you know, I don't really know what I would write. This can provide a very, I'd say, open-ended opportunity for you to write about anything in the world that you want. I had a student a couple years ago who wrote about his love of scuba diving. Well, his love of scuba diving means that when we start talking about what he feels like to be 500 or I don't know how far you go below the surface when you're a scuba diver. I, I confess I've never gone scuba diving, but we'll just say it's 500 feet. When you're 500 feet below the surface of the water, his mind would go in a number of different directions. So when we talk about where you're perfectly content, it could be involved in an activity that you enjoy. Remember back to what I said before about tying together multiple threads. So where are you most content? You're most content when you're dancing on stage as um, a ballerina. You are most content when you're on the football field running a fly pattern down the sideline. You are most content when you're debating your friends at Model UN. This can be an open-ended question to allow you to write about any activity you're involved in. When are you most content? Honestly, when you're speaking another language and tell me a story about when you traveled somewhere else, you learned something different and you emerged better on the other side. As an example here, an environment where you are perfectly content. I had an amazing experience with a student uh, who really wanted to write about traveling to China on an exchange program. Now, certainly traveling to China on an exchange program is incredible and it certainly does set you apart. But there are lots of students that go on lots of different exchanges. Why is it that this exchange program was more valuable than something else? Well, the truth was is that in discovering her love of language and in discovering her love of words and in discovering her love of communication, she found herself halfway around the world, but totally at home while living with a host family. The whole essay was written about the complete different perspective that she now had about what the word home really means. Now, when we think about it in the abstract level, you're like, well, what was this place you were talking about? Where am I perfectly content? I'm perfectly content in a place where I can converse with whoever is sitting across from me having a cup of tea. You can take that from China to New York to Texas to Barcelona. It doesn't matter. This question can be bent to fit a lot of different things. Um, this last one, by the way, the uh, accomplishment event that marked your transition from childhood to adulthood, just be careful that you don't choose one that everyone that would have come to mind. Bar and bat mitzvahs, communions, sweet 16s, they're all lovely and they do mark some kind of transition. It certainly doesn't set you apart unless something at that event was also radically different. If you're trying to make your application stand out, try and pick things that everyone else would not write about. Now I'm going to pause for a moment because I got a whole slew of questions that came in while I was talking about topics. Um, and I want to pause for a moment. Let's see. Um, Okay, I'm going to ask, I'm going to answer one first here that uh, came in down at the bottom. By the way, these questions are great, and I'm glad that you guys are engaged. It always makes me feel a lot better that I'm not just talking to myself. Um, uh, what if you had hardly done any outside activities? This is a frequent question from my students. What if I don't have a four-page resume? Well, first things first. If colleges look at your resume and it's four pages, they already think you're lying because there are only so many hours in the day. Those students who have been in 47 different activities from the ninth grade through the 12th grade honestly could not be involved very deeply in many things. So if you said you've hardly done any outside activities, maybe if you've done one, it's incredibly, incredibly meaningful. But I'm going to also tell you a story about a student who wound up turning the lack of activities into an amazing essay. We sat down to do the brainstorming, and every single time I asked him a question, we literally came up with nothing. He had no real activities that he was involved in, except he loved to write. 
Now, when I say he loved to write, he wrote primarily for himself. Every once in a while, he submitted something to um, one of the school journals or to a local newspaper. But it's not like he wrote a novel when he was in high school. He wound up turning his essay into a brilliantly written satirical take on the fact that he had no activities. To wit, he started off the essay by saying something. I was brainstorming my college essay. And I thought to myself that it might be incredibly important that I share with you about my experience working in sub-Saharan Africa with the orphan children of those parents who had unfortunately been struck down by HIV AIDS. But then I realized that I'd actually never been out of the country. And to tell you the truth, the sight of blood really scares me. So I thought instead of sharing a story that hadn't happened while traveling overseas, I should tell you about the time that I climbed Mount McKinley. But then, of course, I realized that I'm afraid of heights, so there's no way that I would have ever climbed Mount McKinley. So I want to tell you about the time that I stood up in front of class and voiced my opinions at the top of my lungs to argue with a teacher. But then I realized that I don't always like to raise my hand or share my opinions in class because I don't have a healthy respect for all of the different political issues of our day. Every single thing that you imagined another kid could write, he wrote a fake start to the essay and finished by saying that I guess the best thing that I could tell you is that I'm a really strong writer. He got in early to NYU. He made his entire essay almost a refutation of what the college essay was supposed to be. And in it, he was able to demonstrate the one skill. You don't need a lot of activities in order to be able to give perspective. Now, he happened to have that as a particular skill. Maybe writing isn't your thing. Maybe computer programming is your thing. Maybe you should write about the one time that you tried to create a program and it didn't work. Maybe you should write about the time that you thought you were able to build a treehouse and it collapsed on your head. Maybe you want to talk about the time that you were at the airport and you were trying to get on a plane and you got on the wrong plane and suddenly you were in Mexico and you didn't speak the language. Fine. Tell me a story about your life. Just don't leave it flat. If you don't have activities, it's totally fine. Find something that you do. Don't be too hung up on extracurriculars. Um, how can you make a common challenge into something original? This one we often hear as well. It depends on what that common challenge is. But a common challenge might be actually being able to do your schoolwork. If you take me through a typical day, and I'm going to use this one as an example. If you take me through a typical day and it's extraordinarily difficult for you to find time, you might very well have an essay right there. One of my students here in New York goes to Bronx Science. Bronx High School of Science is one of the best high schools in the country, but it is an extraordinary amount of work. And honestly, students also an athlete, not a great one, definitely not getting recruited, but played sports after school. The thing about New York City is you have to travel quite a ways if you live in Queens and you're traveling to the Bronx. It might take you an hour and a half each way. So this student doesn't have a lot of extracurricular activities. This student doesn't have any giant challenges that he or she has experienced outside of school. But you know what the challenge is for this student? Having to get up every single day at 5 o'clock in the morning, trying to get all of that work in, traveling the subways, getting to school. We're surrounded by incredibly competent, incredibly skilled, incredibly genius people. That is a challenge. Trying to keep your head up when you're number 15 in the class and then you drop to number 20 and then you drop to number 100 when you arrive at a place like Bronx Science. You used to be the big fish and now you're kind of a little fish. All of those things are common challenges. But when you wrap it up in the story of a, light, of a day in the life of this student and we finished with what happens when he steps off the train back home at 8.30 at night and begins to prepare dinner for his mother, wow. It was a powerful story of perseverance without it necessarily being that you took a dog sled across Alaska. So you can turn common challenges into something that seems special because it's still unique to you. Okay, now um, I want to take a break from some of these questions. Um, oh, actually, you know what? Um, I just want to mention one more before I shift back. Uh, one of the other questions that just came in is, should I use an anecdote uh, to be able to share um, your story? Without a doubt, the best stories are not you just narrating what you think. The best stories are where you show me and not tell me, which requires you to have a lens to see something special. What we're talking about here is that far too many students literally just write what they think. Now, it's lovely for me to be able to figure out what you think, and I'm all for having you try and share those ideas, but it's much, much better to show me how you behave with others or show me what your ethics and principles are or show me what your personal characteristics are. And those anecdotes are essential. You don't want to tell me what it is that makes you special. You want to show me how you stand out. Now, 
One of the other students that has sent me a question a little bit before had asked, well, how do I connect all of these pieces? First, you want to realize that you don't want to try and connect them at the beginning. The value of free writing. Many of you are sitting here thinking to yourself, Scott, how on earth do I get started? Dude, you know what you do? Just start writing. The worst thing in the world is for you to be sitting and staring at a blank piece of paper. When you sit and stare at just that Microsoft Word document or that Pages space where it's just that little white box, it's infuriating. It's so hard. Just write what comes to mind. The best essays capture vivid description. They capture an amazing backstory. They tell something powerful. But in no way is that going to come pouring out of your fingertips onto the computer in an instant. Start writing in a number of different directions. Don't be restricted by punctuation. Don't worry if you got the wrong words. Just write. The more that you write, the better it's going to be to connect multiple threads. Let me stick with some of the examples I've used before. The Pi and the genetic engineering lab only connected once we saw them juxtaposed on the computer screen. That's when it jumped off the page. We had 12 other things. When we tried to integrate the two, because the question was, how do you integrate it without them becoming too confusing? Think about it this way. We started the story with taking a pie out of the oven and thinking about the steps that you need to take. When we got to recipe step number seven, we took a new paragraph, and we looked up from our microscope to say, and now I was ready to put the Petri dishes into the, I'm not a science guy, perhaps into the Easy Bake Oven. I'm going to assume it's not an Easy Bake Oven, but it's some sort of thing in a genetics lab. Thank God there are people smarter than me trying to cure cancer. But what we did is we took one activity, and because it mimicked the other one, we could transition from one to the other and keep a theme there, even though we just moved direction. When we talk about connecting multiple threads, it's also useful, by the way, to move out of chronological order. Often what we think of is I should tell a story from when I was little to now. That's not that interesting. Stick to the thematic elements that overlap so it doesn't seem confusing. Start now thinking about, sorry, writing about what you've just accomplished by organizing a fashion show to raise money for HIV research. As you look out into the audience, see the little kid. That little kid makes you think about what it was like when you were 13 years old and you joined your first AIDS walk. There we are. We've created a connection by just virtue of where you were physically standing. You can connect multiple threads in a lot of different ways. Be creative. Now, I mentioned the show, Don't Tell, and I think that um, I've covered that, so I'm going to skip down to soliciting different perspectives. One of the other things that students don't often do is get the right kind of advice. As a heads up, there are a lot of people that are going to offer you advice now. Most of them mean well. They are not trying to ruin your essay, although at times it will feel that way. When your mom says, hey, why don't you think about this? And you said, mom, I've heard that 12 times from you. Just be quiet and stop bothering me. Listen, cut her some slack. She's trying to help. When we're talking about soliciting different perspectives, solicit doesn't mean accept different perspectives. It is a very important life lesson. Often when you're 17 years old and you go to adults for advice, and I certainly remember being in this position too, you assume that they always have your best interests in mind and the experience to back up the advice. That is not always the case. There are some English teachers that have amazing experience with college essays. There are some English teachers who have literally never helped a single student with a college essay and only go correct grammar. What you want to do is solicit the perspective so that you, as a budding young adult, can make an informed decision about what to incorporate. When I talk about different perspectives, by the way, asking your parents can certainly be valuable. Asking older uh, friends that have gone off to school can certainly be valuable. They've been through the process. English teachers can be valuable. Um, uh, educational consultants, if you're lucky enough to have an independent educational consultant, the IECA and HECA are full of amazing individuals. Uh, those are people that might be able to help guide you through the college process. Sometimes people have tutors or people that just help on the college essay. There are a lot of opportunities to get advice, but solicit doesn't mean accept. So just make sure that when you're going through your drafting and revising, you're thinking to yourself, okay, I heard what you said, but you know what? I think you're kind of crazy and we're not going to use that idea. One other note about soliciting different perspectives, there are times that people know stories about you that you hadn't otherwise thought of. As an example, a young lady who was writing about her exploration of new ideas. She's Indian. She lives in a big city. She's had an experience of moving from India. She was then talking about how it is that she wants to study international relations. She was talking about expanding her horizons. All of that was great. We were missing the opening story. 
So we were talking with her mother and we talked with her mother. It turns out from the very early age of like six months old or eight months old, I don't know exactly how old you might be to pull this off. She was looking through the bars of her crib and without notice, clambered over the side, dropped from the crib to the floor, scurried across the floor and tried to pull herself up from some kind of little small, I don't know, body at six or eight months old and tried to hang on the door to open the door. We opened the story with somebody looking out through bars, realizing that the world was much bigger than those bars might otherwise suggest. And as she leapt over the bars and yelled freedom, we informed the audience that she was eight months old. And this was the start of her drive to explore her world. Her mom dropped in that story. I wouldn't have known what she was like at eight months old. She wouldn't have known what she was like at eight months old. So getting the different perspectives from parents can often add the opening story of when you were little. That makes you a lot more human. Length requirements, very, very useful in the drafting and revising to understand that length does matter for a number of essays. Some schools will allow you to upload in excess of the length requirements. How amazing is that? That means you've got a little bit of overage so you don't have to be too stressed. Other schools will have text boxes that you cut and paste your words into, so I urge you to be very careful. Take a look at what happens when you upload it. We've had students that have hit submit on applications not realizing that the length requirements cut off their last words. Man, that's brutal. All of a sudden your three great concluding sentences don't make it into the essay. Be careful about length requirements. Also, as a side note, I know how easy it is to fall in love with your writing, to believe that you have written the greatest thing ever. This is something that Dostoevsky would have been proud of. Be fair to yourself. Let other people show you that you don't necessarily have everything perfect here and we might need to cut some stuff out. We often fall into this trap. We fall in love with what we've written, so we can't figure out what to get rid of. This essay needs to be an iterative process. You're going to draft and revise and revise and revise and revise and revise. You don't just write an essay, hit spell check, and consider yourself done. Incredibly useful to understand that the length requirements will force you into keeping just what's the very, very best. Now, beyond the personal statement, and I know, by the way, that a lot of you still have questions um, and I see them coming in off to the side, so I will make sure that you can follow up with me offline after the webinar. But I want you to understand that the personal statement isn't the only thing. I mentioned before that understanding all of the essay requirements is essential. If you don't know what all of your essay questions are, you can very easily wind up missing some very important opportunities to tell your story. Again, I'm just going to write this website down. It's a free way to get all of of your essay questions in one place, collegeessayorganizer.com. Um, when we take a look at understanding all of your requirements, it's incredibly useful to do this at the very, very beginning of the process. So that way you can get all of your essays in place, not just for the personal statement, for your supplements as well. So let's talk about the supplements for a second. When we talk about the supplemental essays, one of the most common is what we call the intellectual interests essay or the why here essay. What do I mean? Just about every one of the major schools you might apply to, not everyone, but many of them, will say things like, why do you want to come to the University of Miami? Why is the University of Texas the best fit for you? Why is it that Lafayette stands out? What is it about the Lehigh community that attracts you? Those essays, students often make a very, very silly mistake. What they do is they wind up writing a love letter to the college. You are not to write a love letter to the college. Like, oh, your campus is so beautiful. Your professors are amazing. They know. They work there. That is not going to be what sets a student apart. Simply regurgitating a brochure or a college tour, that's not going to be the winning combination. When you're talking about the intellectual interests essay, the why here essay, you want to be able to tell a school what you bring to the table. What is it that you have had in your intellectual life, in your academic life, in your extracurricular life that matches up with the facilities, the teachers, the community, the corps d'esprit, the essence that is Emory, that is Vanderbilt? What you're trying to do there is match yourself to the school. Make sure that the intellectual interest essay, the why here essay, is going to be focused on why you match, not just a description of everything that you like there. Otherwise, you're going to be left a little bit short. Um, when I say all of this, this is your chance to complete what we began talking about at the beginning of presenting a complete picture. 
when you're talking about why you fit into the school, your personal statement is step one. The second thing that you're able to do is be able to tell the college, okay, now that we've seen all of the things that I see at your school and how I match, well, now I can tell you that this complete picture that is me makes an incredibly powerful applicant for your particular school. Now, I just want to draw your attention to one particular thing down here at the bottom. This is my email address, Scott F at alisteducation.com. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm the president and founder of A-List Education. If you go to our website, you can find a whole bunch of resources, many of them free. College Essay Organizer, as I said, is another tool that we've built. You can go there and free, get all of your essay questions. I've been incredibly lucky in my life and it's brought me to a really amazing place where I can not only share experiences from how I got here, but also how I help students get to their places in life. I encourage you to use the essay as an opportunity to tell your story. Make yourself come off the page. Be honest, don't be too formal. Just make sure that the essay reflects really who you truly are. Thank you very much for paying attention for the last hour and good luck.